D-Day, the largest amphibious invasion of all time and the beginning of the end of the Second World War. 80 years ago, on the 6th of June 1944, more than 150,000 Allied forces from the UK, US and Canada took part in a combined naval, air and land assault, codenamed Operation Overlord, on Nazi-occupied France. Their aim, to make a foothold in Nazi territory to liberate occupied Europe. But hundreds of miles of fortifications known as the Atlantic Wall stood in their way. The operation had been planned for months and thousands of troops gathered along the south coast of England, waiting for the optimum conditions to launch the invasion. To ensure success, the Allies deployed a series of deception campaigns to fool the Nazis and deflect German resources from the real target, with bombing raids carried out right across northern France. After a day's delay due to unfavourable weather conditions, Operation Neptune, the naval aspect of the invasion, began around midnight of the 6th of June. An hour later, and the first British and American planes flew over Normandy, dropping around 13,000 paratroopers behind enemy lines and attacking key strategic German positions from above. D-Day had begun. Various problems, including navigation, communication and heavy enemy fire, meant that many of the paratroopers landed off course, leaving scores dead or missing. Attention then turned to the beach assaults. German military leaders were expecting an invasion, but they believed the attacks from the air were only an attempt to divert their attention before an attack further up the coast near to Calais. The element of surprise helped tens of thousands of British troops to establish a foothold on beaches codenamed Gold and Sword. The Canadian forces themselves had another beach called Juno, and 73,000 Americans arrived in small landing craft on the westernmost beaches of Omaha and Utah. At Omaha, they were confronted with relentless machine gun and artillery fire. Many of the landing craft became floating targets with casualties beginning to mount. Those who landed at Utah Beach, which had been added as a target at the 11th hour to allow an assault on Cherbourg, were also affected by poor weather. At Gold Beach, British troops faced stiff opposition, but a combination of air support, precise naval shelling and sheer bravery allowed them to secure a beachhead and push on to capture strategically important locations, allowing the flow of essential supplies. At Juneau Beach, almost half the first wave of Canadian troops were killed or injured. Those that did survive managed to take more territory that first day than the British and Americans. And British forces landing at Sword Beach too faced strong resistance. It took until the afternoon for the paratroopers and commandos to fully take control of their intended target. By the end of the day, Allied forces were holding key areas of northern France's coast. Over the next month, US troops were able to push way inland, creating a safe zone around the port of Cherbourg, where they could then land more men and more equipment. Gradually, they continued pushing through northern France, and within three months, they liberated Paris. On D-Day itself, the US Army counted almost 3,500 troops dead or missing, with more than 6,500 more wounded. The Canadians lost 335 men, and almost 1,000 were injured. And while the British Army and Navy did not publish figures, one historian later estimated that around 3,000 had died, gone missing or been wounded. Yet, it could have been far worse. Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill admitted that he had been expecting the toll to be dire, telling his wife that 10,000 would be killed on that first day. While those three nations were the main driving force of the invasion, it is important to say that a multitude of countries contributed to its enormous success.